let us take a brief journey into the world of dark power. This is a wonderful little article published by Public Citizen in reference to Pfizer's power. Now, the reason this is important, especially in reference to or regard to the research world uh, and as well as policymaking, is this has to do with COVID vaccine negotiations. Now, we're not making a statement in reference to basically the quality of uh, the vaccine or anything else like that. But we are looking at dark alley deals and what they'd call bullying of governments and confidentiality agreements. And if you think that self-determination and autonomy are under attack just for the individual, well, wait to see what you can do to an entire nation. And this is power. Are you ready? Let's read a brief excerpt and then we'll get right into the research as follows. Brazil waives sovereign immunity imposed no penalties on Pfizer for late deliveries, agreed to resolve disputes under a secret private arbitration under the laws of New York, and broadly indemnified Pfizer for civil claims. The contract also contains an additional term not included in other Latin American agreements reviewed by public citizen. The Brazilian government is prohibited from making any public announcement concerning the existence, subject matter of the terms of the agreement, or commenting on its relationship with Pfizer without prior written consent of the company. Pfizer gained the power to silence Brazil. Now, obviously during pandemic and lockdowns and give us two weeks and we'll flatten the curve, trust is an incredibly, incredibly important tool when you're asking people to abdicate their personal autonomy. And when that trust begins to look questionable, how can you not expect alternative hypothesis and rationale to basically come into the imagination of the populace in which is being subjugated to proceed. Brazil is not alone. Are you ready for this? A similar non-disclosure provision is contained in the Pfizer contract with the European Commission and the U.S. government. In those cases, however, the obligation applies to both parties. I mean, Europe and U.S. government can't speak and they can't speak back. For example, neither Pfizer nor the U.S. government can make any public announcement concerning the existence, subject matter of terms of this agreement, the transactions contemplated by it, or the relationship between Pfizer and the government hereunder, without the prior written consent of the other. The contract contains some exceptions for disclosures required by law. It is not clear from the public record whether Pfizer has elected to prohibit the U.S. Pfizer has elected to prohibit the U.S for making any statements thus far. And you're worrying about foreign powers? The EC, European Commission, cannot include any announcement or disclosure of the price of dose, the fourth quarter 2020 volumes, or information that would be material to Pfizer without consent to Pfizer. That is truly power. But let's get the positive stuff first. We're going to be covering the research tonight. And again, good morning to our data analysts, data scientists, bioinformatics, uh, epidemiologists, and of course, our data-oriented audience as a whole. Let's start with some positive stuff after going through that dark alley there for a second. So let us begin. This is a wonderful article uh, from basically uh, in reference to gremicidin and melatin. 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 All right, you know what that's from? This is from Bacillus brevis, and this is from bee venom. Potent antiviral therapeutic peptides to treat SARS-CoV-2 infection. But also, too, lactoferrin has made it come back again. And in this case, in the article we're about to cover here a little bit, it's going to get into basically what is its best way to be applied, especially to uh, the respiratory tract, mucosal lining, and so on and so forth. Then... We'll be looking at an incredible, now keep in mind, this is a, they call it an oral vaccine. I really would like them to veer away from that term, but when you look at the outcome into the animal model, it is just fascinating. See, it's not about being pro-vaccine or anti-vaccine per se. In fact, they even changed the name of this oral vaccine and caused it some other prophylactic name as far as inoculation. Uh, something along those lines. I guarantee you to get much better traction, but we'll come back to this in a second. Sorry, I digress. How frequent are acute reactions to COVID-19 vaccinations? Now keep in mind, 
We're only looking at the vaccinations, which are, uh, which are the vaccine of the day. What I'm hoping for as more is revealed and better data collected that basically vaccines are designed along the receptor, uh, what the RBD, receptor binding domain, as opposed to the spike proteins so you can deal with better variants. And so, but in the end, it's not, it's, medicine is a medicine. Just that the medicines that are out today were the medicines of yesterday designed for a variant, which I don't see out there anymore. Even with flu vaccines, they change the flu vaccine every year based upon what they guess the next variant is going to be. Here, we just keep on taking the same thing regardless of the variant. But to proceed, I get digress again. Evidence of transmission, another mystery. This, is, this goes back to the Provincetown, Massachusetts thing. It, when we get into this, all of a sudden, all the individuals, now again, it has nothing to do with vaccinated and unvaccinated. All the individuals that were primarily vaccinated because you had a high vaccine population started rapidly, rapidly uh, coming down with symptomatic COVID at about a 79 or 77% uh, symptom, symptom rate. And you have to remember with the original variant, it was like, you know, over half the people were asymptomatic. So you had a high symptomatic uh, rate here. And then it attacked this area and then went away. We'll get it. It's amazing. We'll check this out in a second. Here we go. Next one. Also do. A uh, new set of provides robust evidence that COVID-19 is a seasonal infection. Again, it's interesting because as you go to uh, lower humidity, it aerosolizes. Humidity keeps it into the droplet form. But however, though, you'll, we'll get into that in a second. All right. Generation lockdown. Brief, brief I'll look into it. We'll come back to that in a second. It just basically a lot of countries had better plans in reference to lockdown. They just didn't uh, pay people money per se. They had to do something in reference to either training or job training. So they prepared the youth for the future uh, as opposed to just paying people to sit on the couch. Generation lockdown is a really good term. I like that. All right, from Cambridge University. The Lancet, I just wanted to show you that real fast. I really discourage, I have incredible respect for the Lancet and I have incredible respect for a lot of the researchers, but there is so much not right with what's currently going on that tying anything else into it, exactly what I would say conspiracy theorists would uh, imply is not really bright right now because you're going to play right into the suspicions and the fears and you're going to make, hate to say it, you're going to make the people that were uh, projecting conspiracies right. And what is a conspiracy truly, in my humble opinion? It is when there is no trust in the bureaucratic establishment at hand. So if your leaders are not trusted, then obviously people are going to be thinking for alternative uh, motivations. But that's not the fault of the person or the conspiracy theorist. That's the fault of the leader for basically breaching the trust of the population. So don't blame conspiracy theorists. Blame poor leadership. Next is this. Uh, a wonderful article uh, in reference to basically they're writing a letter to the FDA because of some concerns in regards to the reliability and legality of the official Israeli COVID vaccine data. It is a good group of doctors However, though, I'm going to read you some excerpts, but however, though, I like the information. It, it's quite uh, brave of the medical professionals themselves. Uh, but however, though, even then, I want to validate. But, I'm going to, but I'll give you the links. I can't yield the validity to it yet because I just saw the article just came to my attention yesterday. And I don't want to present anything that actually has no factual data. So I don't want to, but yet still, it's important because this Pfizer 11 group. So I believe it's worthy to note, and we'll go into that in a second. Pfizer's power. Um, I'm going to link you that. I think we read everything that we needed to read in reference to the um, uh, how incredibly powerful Pfizer is. I mean, again, you take the autonomy away from a country or the sovereignty, uh, that's pretty powerful or pretty weak of the countries for basically, um, you know, caving in so rapidly. Uh, and then, of course, the data sources as follows are going to be our world and data, uh, the GISA, GISA in reference to the variants, 
There is data set. Oh, ooh, 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 here we go. Right, check this out. Here's we're going to we'll get this one out of the way for just. This is the zip file size, right? This is for 2021. All right, I just want to show you this because of the fact checkers, fact checkers. This is you all have the links. There's this is all the data collected so far from 2021 compared to all of the time. It's 519 megabytes just in various data compared to 42 megabytes from um, last year. The, all the vaccine adverse reactions. Uh, so when people say this is the safest thing that's out there, you know, I don't know, but right now from the the overwhelming, we'll just call it circumstantial evidence, uh, it, there's obviously questions of what's going on because the wording that's being presented in the public venue is not matching the amount of data being collected unless a large segment of that data is incorrect. So with that in mind, let's go into the VAERS um, disclaimer. Do, 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 do. Here we go. While they're important monitoring vaccine safety, VAERS reports alone cannot be used to determine if a vaccine caused or contributed to an adverse event or illness. The reports may contain information that is incomplete, inaccurate, coincidental, or unverifiable. And again, that's not just going to go from the various data set here in the United States. That is going to go into the European database as well in reference to the uh, their COVID vaccines. And yes, your uh, your vigilance is I always have to turn those two words. Your vigilance uh, is back up, and uh, their data is fine. But the mortality report to it, their vigilance went up again unexpectedly. Uh, to over 16,000, when it was 12,000 last week, it bounces up and down. I have no clue why that's happening in the data. But yeah, but regardless of that, that disclaimer goes to the European database as well. And then we'll cover our data a little bit later on. Oh, as I promised, here goes. First, real fast, remember that zip file size, 142. All right, so keep in mind, for those not familiar, this is what we have here. We are looking at from 1990 to 2020, if you take all the adverse event reports for the past 30 years, it basically is a 123 megabyte zip file, you know, per se. So we're using the zip file for the convenience of comparison. If you take all of the data just from January 1st of 2021 to today, October 23rd, looking at 142.19 megabytes, that is... 20 megabytes larger than the prior 30 years combined. And as of today is also 16% larger than the 30 years prior combined. That's food for thought. All right, so let's get right into the research as follows. All right, Gramistin and Mil Militin, Militin, Militin. All right, in this study, now, now keep in mind, this is an in vitro study. Now, the important thing to keep in mind, when you have an in vitro study in reference to sars cov 2 whatever it is, you can throw chlorine into the, um, you know, into a Petri dish. And whatever is there, you probably most often, you'll wipe it out. But the trick is you have to have things which are healthy that's not going to be cytotoxic. And so with Bacillus brevis and bee venom, this is what these are, these extracts from Gramacidines and Militin, Militin. I want to say mel melatonin, but it's melatonin. Either with no or very less cytotoxicity. So the Bacillus brevis, many may be familiar with probiotics, acidophilus, and bee venom. Obviously, many are familiar with that as well. And let's just get let's just get into the reading. In this study, we described the anti-SARS-CoV-2 activity of gramicin. They worded it properly, so there's a, they didn't say kill or eliminate. Uh, activity of gramicin S and Middleton peptides obtained from Bacillus brevis and bee venom, respectively. Vitro. Vitro is not a living animal, so these have to be brought into the tests that progress into either animals or people. So, both peptides treated to the SARS CoV 2 infected viral cells showed viral clearance, viral clearance from 12 hours onward to the maximal clearance of the 24 hours post infection. You ready for this? Check this out. This this is just freaking amazing. Now, because the words here don't express what it actually shows in the chart. Let's look at the chart. Ba, ba, ba. 
let's see. Da 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 da. Here, load, load, load. Check this out. Da 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 da. And going down, 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 down. Pass all the people, the contributors, so on and so forth. Now it's not the one. Cell survival. Again, we're looking at cytotoxicity. So don't pay attention to that one. Check this one. Here it goes. Ready? All right. This one right here. Let's make a little bigger. Do do do. Ready? Just in case it has rendered to 4K by then. And plus, it's that impressive. Remdesivir. 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 Ah, I can never say that properly. Remdesivir. All right. Let's check this out. They compared that as part of the control. That's the percent viral reduction. 12 hours. Look at this. The gramacidin and militin. Look at how much reduced it after 12 hours compared to remdesivir. Remdesivir. <laughs> right there. See that? Amazing. 12 hours. Now, ready? Check this out. All right. This gets a little bit better. But this is gramacidin. Look at that. After 24 hours. That's freaking amazing. But yet, it really played it down in the abstract. But look at that. And that's from just uh, Bacillus brevis extract and bee venom extract. And so that is just, or I shouldn't say mil militants actually, they consider it the toxic element of bee venom that causes the inflammation. But bee venom has been used in medicine for quite some time, so it's kind of interesting. But yeah, that is amazing. And again, that is, uh, if we look right here, that's figure three. So those that want to link to this a little bit later on. And you can go down the entire list and it gives you an incredible uh, detailed effect of every aspect or looking at the elements of those aspects of why it works so well. And that's just stuff that hangs around. That's not going to be as harmful as other things, per se, remedizivir. All right. And so that's what it is. But here, figure three. Do, 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 do. Figure three. The gramacidin and mil militin were tested along with remdesivir. <laughs> and that's what the article is. And so it's just amazing. And of course, all the links for this as well. And I wonder if there was one other aspect here I wanted to bring to your attention. Uh, let's see. That's the peptides being used. Uh, yeah, so basically they got some great discoveries in this little article. And again, the weird part about it is if you look at it, we're here, let's see. Da, 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 da. We saw that. Uh, da, da, da. It's interesting. In the case of HIV drugs specific to the virus have been effective to treat disease. Da, 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 da. How about development of the therapeutic antivirals and short span? Well, you get the idea. I want to read a little more into that a little bit around, maybe in something I missed in the first the first aspect of it. But yeah, and if you look at the abstract, we go to the very top again. Let's see right there. Da, da, da. It tells you what they're doing, what they're what what it's attacking, the whole breakdown of what it is, and then as well as that, just in the abstract, it's like anticlimactic compared to the actual outcome of the research study itself. But I will have the links there for as well. And here we go, lactoferrin. This is intriguing. All right, now a few weeks ago, we had an article in reference to lactoferrin 2 in regard to uh, SARS-CoV-2 as well. That was very, very promising. But this one came out a little bit later on, obviously, because we're doing it today. And it gives a little bit of insight into basically probably the best way of utilizing it. Now, here we go. Let's see. It is also found in fluids in the eyes, nose, and respiratory tract. We're talking lactoferrin, uh, intestine, and elsewhere. The benefits are well documented. How it wasn't known to take that known if taking the molecule as a supplement would have the same beneficial value until now. And I'll just read your quote. This very promising molecule that can be adopted as an adjunct therapy for COVID-19. It can be part of a daily routine for people to take along with vitamin C, D, and zinc supplements to keep our immune systems healthy. Particularly now, winter is almost upon us, and we need this extra protection, uh, even more now than during the summer. And we're looking at respiratory tract infections primarily. And so if you look at this right there, that's what we want to shoot for. But however, though, this insight presented to here, which actually is great. Lactoferrin is a great supplement. All right, we know that. But 
Current evidence also favors lactoferrin fortification for infant formula. It won't be long until parents should be able to find lactoferrin fortified infant formulas readily available on the shelves. So that'd be kind of cool, but that's not what we're looking for. Here we go. Do, do, do. Moreover, supplements available in the form of oro dispersible tablets dissolve slowly in the mouth. So keep in mind, oro, oro, disposable tablets dissolved slowly in the mouth are superior to commonly available lactoferrin products and meant to be swallowed with water. So take that hint. All right, so what they're trying to do is saying, you look at the mucosal membranes basically in the mouth and the nose and so on and so forth, which tend to be a primary entry point of uh, you know the respiratory tract infections such as SARS-CoV-2. And it's, it's not mentioned there, that's the big problem. And so that's why. So here it goes. Our superiorly common tune of lactoferrin, the buccal tablets, buccal, buccal, I don't know why, what can you use mouth tablets? All right, mouth, the mouth tablets. Yes, that's a new thing, all right? The mouth tablets not only increase the mucosal concentration of lactoferrin, but also help the absorption and avoids the deterioration by the stomach acid. It says it's a very promising molecule and can be adopted as an unchunk therapy for COVID-19. And we already read this quote. And it could be part of a daily routine for people taking along with C, D, zinc, and supplements to keep our immune system healthy. Particularly now as winter month, death month, we just read that. All right, but you get the idea. And uh, what's it? And so, but if you look at it, it's the trick is, uh, let's see if you see right here. Lactoferrin is one of the key modular substances found naturally in body fluids. I just slide through that, went through that. Uh, the antibacterial, antifungal, anti uh, viral properties of lactoferrin also protect the role against respiratory tract infections. The present meta analysis aims to elucidate the association of lactoferrin administration and, and reducing the respiratory tract infections by systemic, systematically reviewing the data in randomized controlled trials. All right, overall, two studies demonstrate a high risk of bias. The meta analysis revealed a significant reduced odds of developing respiratory infections with the use of lactoferrin relative controls. With sufficient evidence against the hypothesis of no significant difference at the current sample, the alternative hypothesis. All right, so here we go. Conclusions. The administration of lactoferrin shows promising efficacy in reducing the risk of respiratory, respiratory, respiratory tract infections. Current evidence also favors lactoferrin fortification infant formula. Lactoferrin may also have a beneficial role in managing symptoms and recovery of patients suffering from respiratory tract infections. It may have been potential to use an adjunct to COVID-19. However, this warrants further investigative evidence from large, well-designed, randomized controlled trials. So it's actually kind of cool. Now, keep in mind, we're looking at the mucosal levels uh, areas of the mouth and the nose. Major entry points of SARS-CoV-2. That's going to come to us a little bit later on. We're looking at potentially that oral vaccine, quote unquote, uh, as we proceed. But next, here we go. Boosting SARS-CoV-2 immunity in non-human primates using oral rhabdoviral vaccine. Rhabdoviral, rhabdoviral. All right. Now, obviously, I'm not, this is not a necessarily about pro-vaccine. In fact, if, you, if we called it like an oral medication, because that's really all it is, oral medication, uh, uh, or even said oral inoculation, I don't like this word thing. Medicine is medicine. And, you know, all because something's called a vaccine, it shouldn't have to be given special privileges over any other uh, medicine that's a product as well, just because you change a name from that to that. I understand that the difference is inoculation and it's established immunity, but vitamin C can do the same thing for a lot of other ailments. You don't have to see anybody calling vitamin C a vaccine, but somehow we just want to win. We don't want to do what's best for the person. But here we go. However, all currently approved SARS-CoV-2 vaccines are administered via intramuscular injection, which increases the cost and complexity of the vaccination programs, contributes to vaccine hesitancy, and fails, here we go, to stimulate mucosal immunity. Also protective antibody teeters are known to wane, da, 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 natural infection and questionable still, such that periodic booster immunity, yeah. Uh, and there's be boosters and boosters and boosters and boosters from, you know, unless they actually improve the vaccines uh, or look at something different, like therapeutic treatments, uh, this could be never ending. Uh, these are sustained immunity, particularly vulnerable individuals, so long as the virus remains endemic, which most likely it is in the human population. Here to develop or 
orally active viral vaccine capable of expressing the immunogenic SARS-CoV-2 spike glycoprotein oral mucosa. Back to the lactoferrin. Why is those buckle mouth tablets so important when dissolved in the mouth and the mucosal as opposed to basically just swallowing it? That's part of the reason. We exploded the known tropism, uh, tropism of vascular stomatitis virus VSV. All right, here we go. Oh, and it's midnight, so I have the right to speak like this. So here we go. Da, da, da. And let's go down. This is where it gets interesting. Importantly, there was no infectious virus recovered. This is after they gave the oral medicine. There is that word again. Buccal mucosa. Now here we go back again. I like how it all just plays a role. Buccal tablets. You see how it all connects? There, there it is. And that's back. All right. Importantly, there was no infections. The virus recovered from the saliva, buccal swabs from this animal, nor from any body fluids collected from any of the experimental animals. Serum, mouth, nasal. Yeah, that had to be pleasant at any time point. That is incredibly promising. And so, again, there are great, great different treatments no matter what you call them that are out there. And you just, just got to get past, uh, you know, whatever uh, this is. All right, but here we go. And so, but look at this. Let's go a little further. Compared to currently approved mRNA and adenoviral vaccines, which are administered by intramuscular injection, mucosal vaccination, buccal, mouth, oral, we got that down, may offer more reliable and durable defense against SARS-CoV-2 infection. Mucosal surfaces in the nose and the mouth provide the primary portal of entry for respiratory pathogens such as SARS-CoV-2 and are best protected by secretory polymeric immunoglobulin A and mucus and saliva. Back to why the lactoferrin works best when dissolved slowly in the mouth. To proceed, one ties it with the other, but you can see they're both targeting the same thing, so you have some sort of confirmation there. All right, here we go. Proceed. Uh, Secretory polymeric immunoglobulin A is efficiently induced by mucosal vaccines. We'll just call it a tablet, chewable tablet, because they interact directly with mucosal associated lymphoid tissue, such as the lingual and palatine tonsils, which encircle the posterior outlet of the oral cavity. Oral mucosal vaccination, we'll just call it medicine, may also overcome some of the logistical drawbacks of injectable vaccines, such as the limited availability and high cost of virals, needles, syringes, and trained personnel, and the high prevalence of needle phobia in pre-adolescents, adolescents, and college students. Never mind, serva. Comparing to intranasal vaccine, you know, I'm not going to mention any flu vaccines, which are intranasal, but you know they're, out, they're coming out there. Delivery has been successfully developed and developed for influenza prevention. Oral delivery may be preferred approach to avoid the risks and costs of live virus aerosolization, aerosolization, aerosolization and central nervous system exposure associated with intranasal delivery. Since completing these studies, we have developed a process for scaled good manufacturing practice, manufacture of you know, vascular VSV, SARS, CVDH2 plus D in 293 suspension cultures and have demonstrated product stability for up to two weeks at four degrees centigrade. So for those familiar with dealing with the current line of mRNA vaccines in temperature applications and temperature stability and temperature being really, really, really cold. Yeah, this can be delivered in a large section of the globe fairly readily, easily. And, you know, you know, Maybe we call it something besides a vaccine. Is it some other prophylactic? I think it'd be kind of cool. And it'd be kind of neat. All right, the next one. Here we go. Ba -ba -bam. How acute? This, why is it so small? Hang on. Make this bigger. Here we go. All right. We all know about the vaccine reactions with the current selection of menu items presented to our population. But this is getting silly. And the reason being is, again, it's when what people are having to endure with mandates and so on and so forth, and a lot of pundits on TV, which I don't think know what's going on in the real world as far as data is concerned. And, if, you know, let's, let's, let's get into it and you be the judge. 
links will be there as well. How frequent are acute reactions to COVID-19 vaccination and who is at risk? I like this article primarily because every article that represents anything in reference to a vaccine that's about to say something negative has to do this huge virtue, what uh, literally is called the virtue signal, saying, please don't hurt me. I really like vaccines, but I'm about to present you some really disturbing data. This one didn't. So it didn't give you the giant virtue signal of please don't hurt me. They just said, here's your data. You do with what, whatever you want. And this is kind of interesting. Here we go. Do, 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 do. A substantial portion of COVID-19 vaccine recipients reported having anxiety. These are people which are, are getting it before the trial. Depression and insomnia and trouble sleeping, which is quite intriguing. And if you look at the data, for example, here, that's a lot of people. So I don't know if that's... Uh, that's what the normal rate is in society. But if we're, we're in a society where about, about 39 to 40% of people are either anxious or depressed, maybe something's not wrong with the people. Maybe something's wrong with the society. But let's keep on going. Vaccine side effects. Most common vac uh, COVID-19 vaccine recipients, 92% <laughs> reported having at least one side effect at the first or second dose. With the median of three side effects, ranging from three to four across vaccine manufacturers. All right, now that's not the, uh, then of course the, the, like this is, this, you can't make this one larger, but that's not the worst of it. The worst of it is this, all these employers and trying to force people to get vaccinated. This is why a lot of athletes are reluctant, to, especially during season to get vaccinated. You're about to discover why, but here we go, ready? And it, it, not a vaccine, has, you, know, you have a right to be hesitant if once you recognize what some of these uh, reactions are. Now, whether people have them or not, you know, in the beginning they said, well, if you have a reaction to the vaccine that just shows it's working, yeah, well, get to experience this now over six months. I think there's something maniacal about that, but to proceed. All right, here we go. Similarly difficult with self, this is what disturbed me. Those who received two dose regimen reported more side effects at the second dose had died than the first. With the median three side effects, we got that. Uh, more like the second dose of the mRNA vaccine, the first dose of the vaccine, so 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 forth. All right, that's our prelude. Similarly, similarly, difficulty with self care. This really bugs me. Was reported more frequently after the second dose than the first dose for the mRNA vaccines. 36% to 25% for the second dose of Moderna and Pfizer, respectively. Then the first dose is 17 and 11% for Moderna. Of those receiving the JJ and a 27.2 reported trouble with self-care after the single dose. Now, let's look at this. Because this is really kind of like, huh? All right, so here we go. Missed work uh, due to... Trouble with self-care due to side effects. All right. Trouble with self-care due to side effects. Here we are right there. Hospitalized post-vaccination. No, not a lot. But so we're talking self-care. All right. Trouble with self-care due to side effects. Yes or no? 11%. This is the first dose. Oops. Went the wrong way. Here we go back. Now, not only go on days of missed work. Let's go back to that. I won't click on it, but you can see. Look at, there's no way for me to click on it with this program, but I'll show you. First dose of Pfizer trouble with self-care, 11.7%. So you can find that part right underneath hospitalized post-vaccination. 17% with Moderna. Second dose, 25%. Moderna, 36%. And Johnson and John, Janssen and Janssen, we don't see that much anymore. That's self care. That is just unfathomable to me. You're getting a shot and I, you have a problem then taking care of yourself, literally. And of course, the days missed to work were not that much. But however, though, people still, you're expecting people to do this every six months. Uh, you know, eventually what I'll do is run a survival analysis. And the survival analysis is a 1.4 chance of having to seek medical care, 1.8 or 2.3, 1.9. If this is an endemic virus and this is, they don't work on towards better inoculations or more effective vaccinations, and you have to deal with this is the only menu they're going to have to offer. You have a choice between uh, 
a cheeseburger with cheese on the top of the burger or cheeseburger with cheese on the bottom of the burger. You know, that's the two choices we're going to have. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's 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 not a problem with science. It's a problem with monotony. All right, but let's go back to the, the article itself. All right, swollen lymph nodes, inject site reactions, we all know that. Uh, nearly one-third of vaccine recipients report having trouble taking care of themselves with activities such as bathing and dressing due to vaccination side effects. But only 6% having a lot of trouble. Uh, the second dose of both mRNA vaccine, 25 and 36, were associated with greater trouble with self-care than the first doses, obviously. Those who received Moderna, da, da, we know that. Uh, those employed, we know that too. But that is just incredible. That's a lot to ask of your population. And let's see if there's anything else down here, maybe of interest. Nah, that's basically it. So that's 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 a biggie when you have uh, issues with reference to self-care. And so just food for thought, not being anti-inoculation, just that, come on, you know, at least, least pretend you're working towards something better where people don't have to endure this type of um, shot. And then what I'll do is next time too, is I will maybe next week or the week after, I'll do a little survival analysis chart. So if you have 1.6 chance to require medical care uh, and how many times would you be inoculated before the likelihood of you having to have medical care within a certain time period, uh, Kepler Meyer or whatever it is, you guys know. It just means what's the likelihood of how many times. It's like Russian roulette, but you get the point. All right, here it goes. Da, da, da. Evidence of transmission from fully vaccinated individuals, a large outbreak of SARS CoV 2 Delta variant in Provincetown, Massachusetts. I'm just going to read you the text. Now, this is not pro or against or something wrong with the vaccine per se. It It is. Dis- I want, not even disturbing. It is just like how it's a mystery, and it's almost like something just manifested itself out of nowhere, just really, really tore into the vaccinated population. Now, remember, there was not a lot of unvaccinated there. So when you see seventy nine percent of the people being affected are vaccinated, well, if if everyone's vaccinated, then it'll be one hundred percent of the people being vaccinated. So you get the comparison, but it's not just not just that. This was a weird convoluted variant that just came into existence out of nowhere in multiple places, attacked everyone for a day, didn't go outside uh, the town, and then just vanished. So let's get into that in a second. It's really the stuff of like of, of Tom Clancy novels, but proceed. Notably, 74% of the uh, cases were fully vaccinated individuals. 79% were symptomatic. Now you remember, during the time when this first came out, I think, you know, you were looking at it and most people that are test positive, most of them tend to be asymptomatic. So we're looking at a large percentage of the vaccinated individuals being symptomatic. That just blew the entire argument out of the window for the CDC saying, well, you can still test positive, but you won't get symptoms. And then, of course, it, it you know, it. It was a slippery slope. First, it was you wouldn't get ill, then you wouldn't, you know, first you wouldn't catch the virus, then you wouldn't get ill, then you wouldn't get seriously ill, then you wouldn't die. So you could see the 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 keep on changing the goalposts each time. It just means they really don't have a solid clue what's going on, and they're making the best guess that they believe they're making with internal biases. But proceed forward. But that's what it is. So they went from zero cases. And then 14 days to a 456 cases per 100,000 within that peak. That was an amazing, amazing growth. Now, here's where it gets interesting. Check this out. Da, 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 da. A striking theory, theory, theory uh, a striking feature of the dominant cluster was 158 identical consensus genomes, 41% of the outbreak associated genomes in the cluster at the root of the cluster. This pattern may pattern, many identical viral genomes within a short time, usually indicates a rapid spread from a single individual and is a signature of a super spreader or super spreading event. Public health investigation and outbreak, however, revealed no evidence for a single exposure site widely shared among the cases. Instead, the genomic and epidemiological data taken together suggest that the super spreading 
uh, the same viral sequence occurred at multiple locations. Then they give a few hypotheses in reference to that. Then limiting the spread beyond Provostown, we investigated to the extent which cases descending from the outbreak contributed to subsequent increase in cases, largely due to Delta in Massachusetts and the U.S. Approximately half the outbreak associated in individuals reported residency in Massachusetts, the remainder visiting from 20 other states. And basically, that was it. It was a similar analysis show that smaller outbreak clusters had negligible impact on outward spread within the state, not shown. So that was just really, really weird. And then the high confidence of transmission from vaccinated individuals. Of course, you know, that was when that's what shook the CDC up when all the all the uh, the virtue biases, we'll call them, just fell apart. Because, you know, they're not being cheerleaders at that point. They're just, well, they're not being scientists. They're being cheerleaders. No one wants to be wrong. And especially when you're impacting so many people and they all want to have this air of confidence. But, yeah, this shook them up. And so that's where it came down to this massive transmission rate. I want to see if there's anything else. Here it goes. Contact tracing, low viral genetic diversity in this outbreak, genomic and epidemiological data combined with provide combined provide strong support for 21 transmissions from vaccinated individuals and suggestive evidence of a further nine, while genomic data alone provides suggestive evidence for an additional 64. These data suggest that despite high, here it goes, ready to check this out, despite high antibody responses observed for vaccinated individuals from this outbreak, transmission from vaccine breakthrough infections both to both vaccinated and unvaccinated individuals was common. And here we go. The size of the Provincetown outbreak over 1,000 cases and its rapid early growth demonstrate that in a densely crowded events and indoor conditions, the SARS-CoV-2 Delta variant can cause a large outbreak in even mostly vaccinated population. So, you know, and in the rapid decline of the impact of the outbreak existed while Delta driven outbreaks are not eliminated by high vaccination, they could be controlled and well understood public health, or whatever, you know, no one was going on at that time. But that was the main thing. And of course, this article just came out recently. So I, don't think I want to, you know, see if they still continue the same mantra. You know, first they said the vaccinated individuals, here it is, October 20th, right there, that vaccinated individuals don't, you know, transmit and so on and so forth, or transmit less likely. And we had an article, what, from Berkeley the other day, or the UC, UCLA, which stated that they carry the same viral loads regardless. But again, there it is. It, it, just, it was interesting, an article in reference to basically how it, it arose and rose in different locations almost simultaneously, and then it stayed limited to that area and uh, with minor effect outside that area. All right, but proceed. Here we go. New study provides robust evidence that COVID-19 is a seasonal infection. Important to know because this doesn't appear like it's ever going to end. To proceed, higher transmission rates were associated with lower temperatures and humidity. This is why. The seasonality could contribute importantly to the transmission of SARS-CoV-2 since low humidity conditions have been shown to reduce, let's make this a little bigger, the size of the aerosols and therefore increase airborne tr transmission of seasonal viruses such as influenza. The seasonality could contribute importantly to transmission to SARS-CoV-2 since low humidity conditions have been shown to reduce the size of the aerosols. Now, you have to read that a few times because what the meaning is smaller particles mean NPIs, non-pharmaceutical interventions, potentially like distancing and masking and things like that may not have the intended protective effect as basically stated. Now, keep in mind too, things change. And most of the, the tests in reference to distancing and masking are in lab, uh, laboratory conditions. And here, especially when it comes to the micron size, once you drop below five microns, you know, things get really, really sketchy really, really fast. And so I'd be curious to see someone do an outdoor test and see exactly what a transmissible level of SARS-CoV-2 is with the low micron size. So what they're saying is low humidity, not high humidity, low humidity 
uh, basically contributes to the transmission of SARS-CoV-2. Important to note, but the link should be there as follows. Generation lockdown, just a couple of highlights. Experts argue that many countries simply repackaged existing and often already failing policies without the necessary funding or tooling to benefit the under 24-year-olds, which they're hit hard now. A lot of them are just that going back to work, it's going to be a whole different ballgame. But what we did is basically just threw money at people. Other countries, though, were a little bit more innovative. And I want to give you an example of that because for policymakers out there, there's still an opportunity to improve things. You know, first you got to admit it's broken, and then you got to make it better. The report suggests that since the pandemic began, more than one in six young people globally were made redundant or stopped working with severe impacts on their mental health and well being. Many young people were employed in areas worse hit by the pandemic. All right, proceed. And this gives you an idea what some of the other countries did. These include South Korea's one-off cash transfers, young job seekers, job seekers, reiterate, and government-backed paid apprentices in Malaysia, while the EU reinforces youth guarantee scheme with member states aiming to provide everyone under the age of 30 with education. Trainer, traineeship or a job within four months of becoming unemployed. I don't know how that worked out, but however, though, that's better than just paying money to sit on the couch for an entire year. You understand? So with the kids now, you know, in the United States with the education issue in reference to lack of job training and so on and so forth, uh, I just wanted to highlight that, for whatever it's worth. Again, this from the Lancet, urgent action needed to integrate climate change mitigation to COVID-19 recovery plans to address global inequities in health and build a sustainable future. Now, there's nobility in the recommendation from the Lancet because we're talking global cooperation. However, though, I err on the side of caution because obviously trust has been diminished uh, from the very beginning. I mean, think about it when everyone said, give us two weeks and we'll flatten the curve, give us 100 days of mask wearing and it'll be over and then the vaccine will come out, it'll end it. Well, I don't know how many times, you know, these predictions have been inc inaccurate. And um, I think right now I would probably veer away from making any sort of uh, tie-in as such. So again, just as a word of caution, no, not a good time. But to proceed, next, Israel. Now, this was basically, now the publication here tends to be, uh, I want to, I'm not going to use the word freedom, uh, I'm not going to use the word conservative, but freedom orientated. You know, basically, in everything, all because a publication is, is dedicated to self determination and autonomy, I'm, I quite admire. But however, though, I do understand that sometimes other individuals can be concerned about leading to biases. So, however though, regardless, I'm not attacking the messenger here, and that would be wrong, because I'd be also incorporating a bias. I just wanna look at the message. So the message as it stands, is as follows. Israeli physician scientists advise FDA of severe concerns regarding reliability and legality of official Israeli COVID vaccine data. And a lot of data comes out of these Israeli models. We've covered quite a bit of it. But I'm just going to bring you a couple of highlights to direct you to the article so you can delve into more into your own. To proceed, an independent group of Israeli group of physicians, lawyers, scientists, and researchers called Professional Ethics Front today advised, make this a little bit bigger, advised the U.S. Food and Drug Administration regarding the upcoming FDA discussion on the administration administering COVID-19 vaccines to children aged 5 to 11. I, again, I, I would, it'd be very, there's not a scientist out there that cannot postulate or formulate an argument as to why and why not that should, this should occur as far as inoculating children uh, with a vaccine that did not go through the traditional approval of multiple years per se. I'm trying to say things that don't get me censored. It's been tough this past year, but you're gonna understand why I parse my words. Expressing severe concerns regarding the reliability 
legality of the official COVID vaccine data. It says, quote, we thus see it as the utmost importance to convey a message of warning and raise our major concerns regarding potential flaws in the reliability of the Israeli data with respect to the Pfizer BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine, as well as many significant legal ethical violations that accompany the data collection process. That is a pretty high level statement because that's claiming um, shenanigans per se in a legal level that could have exposed people to potential harm unnecessarily. But to proceed, uh, da, 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 here we go. A petition to the Israeli Supreme Court of Justice. This is interesting with reference to the Ministry of Health and the adverse event reporting. I'm just going to take you an excerpt here to give you an idea why I wanted to bring this to your attention. The Ministry of Health to implement the above mentioned necessary improvements to the form. Unfortunately, the modification, this is about the adverse event reporting. So to back up a little bit. Healthcare professional citizens of Israel who want to submit reports to adverse events following vaccination are unable to do so as there's no possibility for either of these populations to also search through the data, rendering impossible the examination of the reported adverse events by other citizens, physicians, and independent researchers. Instead, there's only an online adverse event reporting form available to the Ministry of Health website. This form, however, was for many months not useful. This does not allow inclusion of personal contact information. The free text field intended to describe the adverse events comprised a limited number of characters, and the symptoms list available to choose from was limited, as well as included only mild adverse event terms. Meaning, say, all right, you don't feel well, so did you have a headache, did you have fatigue, or do you have injection site pain? That's the only three you got to choose from. Choose, so you have an adverse event, report one of your adverse events. But what if it wasn't that? To proceed. Moreover, no tracking and monitoring of even the most sensitive population Let's, then we go back here. Petition to the Israeli Supreme Court of Justice has led the Ministry of Health to implement the above mentioned necessary improvements to the form. Unfortunately, the modification of the form was made very late, as the majority of the adult population had already been vaccinated. Furthermore, since the report is not publicized in a transparent manner, just like, for example, the various database that you and I go through, it it's very difficult for an individual unless they know how to basically... Um, scrape through the data to basically postulate any sort of uh, potential outcome. Is only recipient that's the sole owner, the Ministry of Health sole owner of the data, just like VAERS, CDC, and the decision-making authority and utilization dis distribution of it. Not much different than we have here with VAERS. Moreover, no tracking and monitoring of even the most sensitive populations such as pregnant women and the elderly is taking place. For example, as part of the National Senior Population Protection from the COVID-19 program in Israel, a reporting system was activated in April 2020, which presented detailed reports almost daily on COVID-19 eruptions, on hospitalizations, and on mortality in nursing homes. However, on December 29th, 2020, the very day the vaccination campaign commenced in nursing homes, the publication of these reports was abruptly discontinued. And is noops, what happened there? bounce back and has never been resumed since. So that, that was the article. So basically that must be the article. Health ministry again lacks, oh, where do I go? Da -da. Oh, have to look at sweaters. All right, that's really cool. But however, though, the article which we brought, probably saw before all the pops came, there it is. Health ministry again lacks elderly morbidity tracker laps after four bridge reports. Interesting. To proceed, back with the other article. So you can see why I wanted to bring this uh, article to your attention since a lot of the individuals uh, are concerned in reference to data collection. So the Israeli data, how accurate is it? I don't know. Data distortion, violations in the collection process. We can go down the entire line. The medical professionals will put themselves in the line. Little quote from Leviticus there. Uh, they're concerned. And so I want to have the link at least to you as well. And so you can review the information on your own and see if it is valid. All right. And then what we did, kind of ironically, 
Boom. Here we go. Pfizer's power. That was presented by Public Citizen. And a lot of times these things, they all happen in synchronicity. And so something's there, it looks like. Something's there that is making us as a population go, that doesn't seem right. And something seems a little off. I don't like these. And honestly, too, when you have secret deals, abdication of government sovereignty, I understand why they're trying to protect the copyrights, protection, and so on and so forth. But, you know, the FDA approving certain things without having full disclosure on the information, um, you know, it's, again, I don't have to spell it out. But now let's get right into the data as follows. So before beginning it, I want to go back to the various data uh, list right here as a disclaimer. Very important. These are reports to the VAERS data system, reports to. The CDC has to be the one to validate which reports are accurate and not accurate. And um, there's a lot. And so, I mean, again, we're looking at what? Imagine, that the, I'll put this in perspective for you. Think about this. You have CDC personnel. And if I took all the data from 1990 to 2020 and I dropped it on one of the, the, CD, the CDC administrator's desk and said, hey, can you go through this data uh, over the past 30 years and see if you notice any patterns, so on and so forth? They'll say, yeah, mm, give me an office of 100 people and we'll start going through the data over 30 years. So here's the problem. When the data collected since January 1st to now is greater than the prior 30 years, whom is being authorized, or I should say, whom has a responsibility of going through all that data? And are they going through that data? I'd be really curious because I haven't heard anything from anywhere because whoever's got to go through all this data over 30 years worth of data and you have to almost do it in real time? Seriously? Well, again... Let's get back to here. Let's see. Da, da, da. And let's see if there's anything else here of interest. Not a particular, I don't think I have here. Nah, nothing there. But here we go. Let's go to Veris first. Again, remember what we look at as far as disclaimers. Come on, Veris, pop up. All right. So we're looking at 624,234 reports to Veris since January 1st, I think until October 19th. And I have October 23rd here. There's our vaccine reaction reports. All right, reactions by age, as you can see, a nice little bell curve there. Reported COVID vaccine related deaths to VAERS. Now it's 7,832. Again, I want to emphasize requires verification. All right, ba -ba scrolling down, scrolling down, scrolling down. And I'll get these charts better organized. But we, see, the problem is the whole dynamic keeps on changing. You want to read some of the, the charts right here again because people don't recognize uh, what I read on a daily basis is pretty sad. Uh, he developed a problem bad chest discomfort. He thought it was, whoops, where we go here? And, you know, a chest discomfort, he thought it was indigestion. Treated as such, when he got no relief, he went to the emergency room. Uh, illness complications, so on and so forth. This is the myocarditis. Um, you read articles like this continuously resuscitation unsuccessful. These are not people just randomly throwing things out there as far as reports. These are pretty serious reports. That's why I want to know who is going filtering through these reports, trying to find out the validity, found the cease. It's like, oh, uh, it's like real. This is this is the one's reference to myocarditis. Um, so you can see these are actual, these are, these are really, a lot of them filled out by healthcare professionals, but perceived. Uh, down. This is the vaccine. I have to make it smaller now because this is the vaccine reactions. Where we go, we can bounce it up and down here. Uh, 2021 versus all of 2020. There's 2020 right there. This is 2021, and the year is not over. Uh, the vaccine reactions reported to VARES for the the truth checkers out there. Uh, basically, other reports. Just so you can see the validity. Uh, developed fatigue, body aches, headache one day after vaccination on 3 3, the morning at 3 5, complaint chest pain, took Tylenol, 10 30, and his family found him unresponsive. The reason this, this, read this, and this, I have a hard time with this. 
Uh, and again, anybody that's pro inoculation, that's fine. And they, they think the risk is worth it, whatever it is. Uh, you know, and you get to read this. You're reading information of people that have succumbed under the age of 22. So basically, you get to read it. A lot of it involves depression, anxiety, uh, you know, these, these are not, you know, this is like horrible. If you read this, my son died while taking his math class on Zoom. Uh, a healthy boy had good academic giving. This is horrible. Uh, but again, it's you can't be cavalier about this. Like, oh, people are anti-vax, whatever it is. No, it's people have the, the, the right to question things. And but again, this is a, a battle of autonomy and self-determination, as we said from minute one. Common reactions, oops, bounce up a form. This is the word cloud. Top 30 uh, reported symptoms, all ages. Da da da. All right, there's that. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm seeing a lot more of these. If you could read this when it's on 4K. Uh, the case was classified as invalid. Uh, but otherwise, you see, uh, most common re vaccine reactions from people that have passed. Reported to, so these are the words that so you're going to be reading there more often. Uh, these are the reactions associated with those which made a report to VARES that have passed away for whatever reason. A lot of, again, as we said last week, a, a lot of the COVID-19 uh, seem to be breakthrough cases and the mortality. So again, it's really tough to dis delineate, but to proceed. Uh, reactions by age. Um, seeing some things there, which is it must be through uh, lactation or something like that, but I'm seeing younger and younger now, for whatever reason, being inoculated, which this is really unusual because I thought it wasn't approved between the ages of five and 11. So I don't know why I'm seeing these pop up right now in the uh, in those younger age groups. Uh, proceed. Uh, lots of uh, reports, big deal. Uh, children, the most often the reactions that uh, are written in the reports that are submitted to VARES. And let's see. Da, da, da. Top reported symptoms in children reported to VARES. Again, headaches, you know, a lot of them are superfluous, but still, these are the, the top reports. It doesn't have to be serious, just the top reports. Then going down. Da 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 just go down here and then I want to go back to here. Here we are. What I'm looking at right here is the vaccine reaction reports of interest submitted to VARES from January 1st until October, I'd say 19th, then this is the 23rd. Most of these seem to be COVID breakthrough cases, shingles, thrombosis, mortality, Bell's palsy, myocarditis, paralysis, Serva and thrombocytopenia. So looking at 3,720, uh, 3, uh, one reports two VARES in reference to thrombocytopenia. Serva, 4,692, which is a shoulder injury, which is nasty. 5,600 uh, or 5,598 uh, paralysis, which probably is a subgroup of Bell's palsy. 5,820 of myocarditis. I will get the average age. Uh, the average age is about 21 right now, uh, per se, a report submitted to VARES. Mortality. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm going to start getting the average age for that as well. Thrombosis, 9,045 reports submitted to VARES. 18, this is always weird to me. 18,202 cases submitted to VARES in reference to shingle outbreaks. I suppose those are in the people already had shingles prior. And 88,500 reports to VARES, 88,515. Remember, I, they, they told you this was an impossibility? Well, not a, not if any of these reports to VARES uh, end up being accurate, depending on who's going through those reports to check the validity. But let's begin for expediency. All right, next, a rebuild. So we're looking at, at the average age of uh, mortality. If we can get down here, let's see here. All right, so average age, let's make this a little bigger. 
Average age of mortality, uh, 85 or older is still the number one age group, which is succumbing to uh, COVID. Uh, 75, 65, 74, this is all CDC data that we're, we're basically scraping. These are data sources for our fact checkers. And then let's just scroll down to the beginning. Let's look at Florida again. Cause let's just go do 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 because it's already been an hour. So let's see. Do 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 do. All right, let's look at this real fast. New deaths per hundred thousand. Again, we're looking at May twentieth. Looking at three per hundred thousand of twenty twenty. And you notice the trend here, seasonal trend potentially as uh, as propagated prior to about a more average mortality at three point three two. Nobody was vaccinated. So this is where I look up, sorry, 2.88 as of April 15th, 2020. No vaccinations, nothing. The major outbreak of the pandemic. 2.88 was the average mortality rate. It went down to as low in July, 2020, almost down to one. We vaccinate the heck out of everyone and our mortality rates are actually worse than they were back then. You be the judge. I mean, we can just bring it all the way over here. So that's now. Yeah, you be the judge. Take it on your own. All right, here we go. Here we are. So here we are. Remember Florida? The world was going to come to an end, and all those problems were going to happen. Then all of a sudden, boom, these weird little spikes. And they just go up and down, up and down. All right, then up and down. And look at this. Let's bring it up. Let's see how they're doing comparatively today. So what do we have? Florida is at 0.28 deaths per 100,000. 0.28. California, 0.24. So no lockdown Florida, no Monoculation, Florida mandate, no mask mandate, Florida. Is that 0.28? California, is that 0.24? All right, New York, 0.94. Very embarrassing for New York if Florida is doing so much better. In Texas, we know Texas has issues, but it's up there pretty high, regardless. But again, correlation, causation, uh, different policies, different places. You make the judge. Why is Florida doing better than New York and almost the same as California with no disruptions to the economy, to education, uh, and or workplace environments? And again, that's not for me to decide. It's for you to decide. I just look at the data. There it is. All right. And anything else here of interest? Do, do, nope. Nothing just there. Mutations. Here we go. I don't have to speed along. We really spent a lot of time on other stuff. Mutations. Come on, mutations. All right, here. Yep, let's see if we get here. And come on, come on, come on. Move. All right, let's see what we have. Da, 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 da. All right, here we are. I'm just going to break it down real fast. These are the amount of people vaccinated, fully vaccinated per 100. And remember, the human developed, the countries we chose have a human development index of 0. 0.6 or greater and a population of 5 million or more. Portugal, United Arab Emirates, Spain, these are the amount of people vaccinated per 100. All right, so that's what we're working with, all right? All the way down to here. Let's look at our comparisons. Here we are. Whoop, you know what? I think there's one thing we forgot, almost forgot. All right, here we are. This is, one of the, this is the chart. All right, just for speed, we're just going to look at these real fast. Whoop, went up too far. Back down. Here we are. Remember this little number here, 0 to 10, 11 to 20. These are people vaccinated per 100. All right, we got it. Total cases per million, 0 to 10. The people vaccinated per 100, 71 to 100 cases per million. All right, deaths per million. So we're trying to compare apples to apples. 0 to 10, 0.55. 60 to 70, 0.82. 71 to 100, 0.95. 50 to 59, people vaccinated per 100, 1.32. And I'm trying to find 
you know, a solid correlation. There's other confounding involved, without a doubt. Now let's look down. Reproduction rate. If you want to use the reproduction rate as your guide, 0 to 10 people vaccinated, 0.74, 11 to 20, 0.86, 21 to 30 people vaccinated per 100, 0 0.79, 71 to 100 people vaccinated, reproduction rate of 0.95. New, oh, look, it dropped off the x-axis. New cases smooth per million. I just don't think the people which are not getting vaccinated want to play anymore. Uh, 71 to 100, 170, uh, 0.04. Well, you get the picture. Uh, just draw your conclusion. If you were an alien from out of the world and, out and didn't care about politics or anything, just look at the data presented as a whole. Now, obviously, confounding can play a role in mitigation factors and non-pharmaceutical interventions and everything else of that. I wouldn't hold much weight in basically the what's being done, at least at this scale, is affecting this just from a pure data-oriented aspect. Now, the weird part about the way they're doing the data research is they're really only looking at what happens inside particular countries. They're not comparing countries to countries. They're just comparing what's happening inside the country. So a lot of the research I read, you know, is basically just inside the country. Let's look at this real fast. Better way of looking at it, fully vaccinated per 100. All right, you got it right down here. And there's Kenya, all the way up to Portugal, as we looked at the chart before. All right, total deaths per million. You see any comparison? Uh, reproduction rate. I mean, just tell me when you see a pattern. All right, you see anything, anything unusual? I don't know, the target must be going negative on the reproduction rate, but still. Fully vaccinated per 100. Total cases per million. Compare it to fully vaccinated per 100. From a geopolitical sense, you've got to show me how is the policy working. All right, scroll down real fast. Variants, the trends, da da da. USA, mortality per million at about five. Positivity rate, 0 0.08. Remember those numbers. If they're fully vaccinated, we know. India, deaths per million. United States is at five. India is at about 0 0.01. Positivity rate. What, 0.01 around that area too? So again, vaccination rate, they went up a little bit, but that doesn't look like they're interested anymore. All right, I'm gonna scroll down real fast, look at variants. Here's our variants. The only one of concern we have here is mu. Mu appears to be a pop, uh, popping up in Spain. It's an up 2.5% of the sequences. Delta is still the primary. I looked at others, and others has popped up in the United States. I don't know what others is, but it's a concern, so maybe we'll know what it is later on. But that's just to give you an idea. All right, and again, you can see the spread all over across the area as far as gamma, lambda. Uh, but as far as most recent reporting, Delta is still the primary, and we will check out mu a little bit later on. And as you can see, the, the change in the patterns there. Let me see one more thing real fast. Nope, nothing else of interest there. All right. And then we are going to go to, do, 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 which one is this one? Europe. Let's go to your Durvigilance. Here we are. Let's go to the top. All right, what do we have? Yeah, let's see real fast. We have reports of total reactions. We are 1 million. Let's make that bigger. 1 million. Let's see, 70,631. All right, you can see the reactions from each one. That's from Endura Vigilance site right off the bat. There's reactions reported to Endura Vigilance. Let's read or let's clarify that. All right, of those, we have 516,040 serious events reported to Endura Vigilance that require hospitalization. So that's what a serious report is defined in Europe is that requires hospitalization, 516,040. The most common occurrences, obviously, 
16,045 mortality has the cases reported to the Dure Vigilance. That is a fatal designation. Most common, that's your word, uh, word cloud, most common thing. And we'll just go down here because it'll be easier and for expediency. Here we are. Arthralgia, joint pains, chills, headaches, fatigue. It could, you, know, you go down the line, it's all the way throughout as far as you see the Bell's palsy popping up there as two. Decreased appetite, malaise, you get you get the picture. So those are the ones, these are the reports, serious reports that are reported to their vigilance that require hospitalization or of some sort or the other. Um, like, you know, it could be a combination of events, but still, you know, there it is per se, influenza-like illness. You see a lot of them could be like questionable, but you get, you get the point. And then I'm starting to bring up the Twitter and the Twitter just for web scraping. And what I'm trying to do right now is see if I could, we could figure out later, later on any interesting aspects that could be popping up, do a little bit of scraping. Like for example, this one, I basically you included the words vaccine, uh, reaction and COVID. And then the information comes up. And just be careful when you guys tweet stuff, I wanna give you an example here briefly, not to be moaning anybody, that everything pops up and it's really easy to scrape you know oh you know as far as what is said what's there followers all incredible amounts of information can be scraped so just be cognizant of that this is me as far as my uh, what happens on my site but still just be just be aware if you post something online it's there for good uh, and images and everything but to proceed these are the words being pulled out, da 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 da, and then these are the, the chatter, which I call chatter. And as far as you know, it's not. I'm not doing uh, sentiment analysis. What I'm trying to do is, is find uh, signals that can lead to something else. As far as what words are there, as far as combination, so on and so forth. This is a very small sampling, but we'll make it bigger as soon as I get this up. Uh, this chart down properly. So, with that in mind, let's begin to let's close this out. All right, here we go. What we cover? Do do do. Our data. There's the data sources. That da backwards. Pfizer. Power. Wow. Israel. Concern. Data collection is um is they don't believe it's reliable, and they brought it up to the FDA, and they said, hey, stop using us as far as that data collection. Again, these be uh, validated, but however, though, interesting article. It's worth it's worth a look. The Lancet. Yeah, it's really cool. Let's hang on just a little bit. I understand that they're tying climate to health. And I understand the exact reason why, and it, it, I understand. But right now, probably not a good idea to combine the two. Um, generation lockdown. There's some good alternatives there from other countries. Uh, low humidity, higher chairman submission rates. Something to think about. Uh, evidence of transmission, province of Massachusetts. Just a good mystery novel. Uh, frequently of how often people uh, can't take care of themselves be, after being vaccinated. Yeah, I don't have to add anything more to that. Um, really, really, really cool thing of an oral medication that can really help protect the mucosa from SARS-CoV-2 eventually. Hopefully that brought to human trial, but it's great thinking outside the box. Lactoferrum. Incredible article validating lactoferrin to meta analysis, and of course, the best way to take it. Buckle, book, buckle, buckle. Man, like buckle vaccine, buckle lactoferrin, and mucosal lining is the key element there. And so, and then two, really promising in reference to elements derived from Bacillus brevis and bee venom. Really cool, simple, available, and man, was it again? It was just like. Come on, come on. Super potent, at least in vitro, meaning not a living organism, and while being relatively safe to human cells, and it kicked butt on traditional medications which are currently being utilized in place. When that's just amazing. Well, that's it for tonight. It's a long night, about, I think, one hour and 19 minutes. But regardless of that, all the links will be there. Please keep in mind, 4K will be rendered, too. It takes some time. But honestly, 
Good night. I am humbled if you watch this long. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It'll begin. The way to that's 4K. I'll have it all bookmarked and chaptered so you get easy reference. But sometimes it takes 12 hours. Sometimes it seems like it takes an eternity. Good night, all. And I'll see you all next time. Catch you then. Bye.